Buckle up for a new episode of Bumpaholics, the one and only podcast made to teach on all stages of the arrival of a baby before, during, and after. Whether you're an expecting mother, have questions about fertility, difficulty with lactation, or postpartum, you're sure to learn from our experienced doulas when you listen to Bumpaholics. Hi, everyone. Welcome to KC Women's Ministry. My name is Kristen Mason, and I am the executive director, and I am so excited today to be joined by Tamika of Jace's Journey. Hi, everyone. I am Tamika Isaac. I am the executor, executive director and founder of Jace's Journey, located here in Denver, North Carolina, and I'm really excited to be here to talk to you guys and share my story. Um, speaking of story, can you tell us your birth story with Jace? Yes, I can. Uh, I can absolutely tell you my birth story with Jace. So Jace, uh, he got pregnant with Jace in 2017. It was November. I remember because my friend, one of my really good friends was having a party and I was like, you know, we were trying. So I was like, Ugh, I need to take this test. My cycle hadn't started. So I won't drink if I'm pregnant, right? Like, you know, so let me go ahead and take this test. So I took the test and turns out I was pregnant. I'm like, you know how you are like, oh, oh, because we've been trying for, I think over, over a year, probably over two years. And I was like, okay, so how am I going to tell Brandon? Because Brandon had gone to work and I normally take, I would take pregnancy tests while he was not at home. So if it was negative, I did, you know, like he wasn't, you know, I didn't want his feelings to be hurt. I'm so, yeah. so such a great wife. Um, <laughs> so, so I took it and it was positive and I'm like, okay, so how am I going to tell Brandon? So I ran out to the Target and got like this onesie, ran out to like Michael's, got these letters, these iron on letters and I iron on baby Isaac on this, on this black long sleeve onesie. And I got a, a card and it, I wrote in like all the dates, the milestones, like first trimester, this starts, da, 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 all these things. And it just so happens June 14th was actually my due date. So like a day ago, and mm -hmm. well, two days ago was actually my due date. And it's also Donald Trump's birthday. So, so I was like, yeah, mm, no, no. <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah. Good that news is only 6% of women have their babies on their due dates. So, right. you know, it probably wasn't going to happen, but I was like, no, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> we don't want this to happen. Um, I'm sorry if anybody's offended by that, but hey, it is what it is. So I get, I get, you know, this onesie, I write this card. I have these pregnancy tests because I ended up taking two and I give it to him. He looks at me, he's like, are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> Pretty serious. <laughs> like, are you serious? Yes. Like, why would I play this terrible joke? This is not even, this is a terrible joke. Like, no. So he was like super excited. And I had a great pregnancy. Like, Jace was amazing to carry. I didn't have morning sickness. I didn't really have a lot of cravings. I probably gained about 25 pounds. And so like, you know, it was, it was really good. I was, you know, you know, growing, <laughs> no, mm -hmm. all the things. And at about 34 weeks, I go in for a regular appointment. Cause you know, at this point we're going in every week mm -hmm. and they are like, oh, he's measuring small. I'm like, okay, you know, what do we do? Right. Mm -hmm. And he was, they were like, you know, we want you to go to maternal fetal medicine because of, Backstory, I'm 40 when I get pregnant. So of course I'm automatically deemed high risk. I'm right. automatically put on a low dose of aspirin to pre prevent preeclampsia because that's what they're telling me I'm high risk for. So we're at 34 weeks. I'm at this appointment. He's measuring small. They send me to maternal fetal medicine to get another ultrasound, to get an, ultra, to get an ultrasound. And I get there and they're like, the results were they couldn't see my umbilical cord because he was moving around too much. So they're like, well, you have an appointment next week. We'll just, you know, check next week. Next week comes around and these are like Thursday appointments. So that one was May 4th. Uh, May 10th comes and back, you know, back for the regular, this week is the non-stress test. So um, I take the non-stress test and they're like, oh, he failed the non-stress test. I'm like, okay. 
what do we do? They mm-hmm. said, we need for you to go to maternal fetal medicine. We need for you to get another ultrasound. Like, okay, here, you know, I'm going back. I'm going to maternal fetal medicine the same day. Like what, whatever you say, I'm going to do this, like whatever. So I go and they're like, oh, he's fine. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. He's fine. So that weekend was actually Mother's Day weekend in 2018. And that Sunday we had gone to my mother-in-law's house and, you know, just hang out with her for the day. And I had mixed like all this really crazy food together. Like, not like, you know how you're, you're just pregnant. Like, oh, oh, that sounds good. Well, let me just have all of that. So I, you know, I ate all this stuff and, you know, we, we got back home and, in kind of the middle of the night, I woke up and my stomach was like really hurting. I'm like, ah, well, probably shouldn't ate all that stuff together. And it's like a really bad stomach ache. So I'm like, well, maybe let me just go poop. Let me try to poop. So I did and I couldn't. And what happened was I ended up throwing up. And, you know, once I threw up, I actually felt better. So I went to sleep. I woke up that next morning and I was kind of sore. And, you know, my abdomen, I was sore. So I was like, oh, it has to be from throwing up. You know, these are the thoughts in my head. And so I was just like, ah, but I don't feel good. Maybe it was food, like my thought was it was food poisoning. And, you know, I just kind of laid around for most of the day. And my husband, you know, because I was, I didn't feel good. He was like, oh, let me call your friend, my best friend over. She worked from home, so she could just sit here. So she came over and she, you know, was sitting down, downstairs in her house, just working and at about 4.30, 5.30, between that time, I was probably like 4.30, I asked her to come because I was still feeling that soreness in my abdomen. I asked her to come help me go to the bathroom. And she, you know, she came up and, you know, she tries to get me up and then I pass out. So I wake up, I'm on the floor. I wake up and, you know, she's on the phone with 911. I hear her on the phone with 911, but she's also like using my phone to call my mother. So my mother, like she puts the phone to my ear for my mother to like talk to me to make sure I stay awake or whatever. And then the ambulance comes, they put me in this really crazy looking contraption called a stair chair and they take me, rush me to the hospital. We arrived to the hospital at 6 p.m. And you know, by that time, my husband, he worked about 30 minutes away. He was there. He came in. Some of my family and my friends were there. And I think they did a Doppler. Um, and again, I'm kind of like coherent, but like out of it at the same time. Like, I think I was like really dehydrated or something. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of what happened in the, their p- bits and pieces of what I remember from like that ER visit but what I do remember is at 7.50, and the, you know, hospital records actually confirm a lot of the stuff. They, they did a Doppler and nobody said anything. And then they do this ultrasound at 7.50. And Kristen, it got really eerie in the room. It was like this very quiet, weird feeling. And I remember still kind of, my mom still kind of being on the phone and me saying, I don't, they don't know what they're doing. Like, I don't think they know what they're doing because it was just really, it was a really awkward feeling. And by this time, a doctor comes in and she looks at me and my husband. She says, oh, your son died in utero. And we were devastated, like completely heartbroken. And just the delivery of it is, what we both remember about this engagement, right? So yeah, your son died in utero, but we can't really worry about that right now because you have HELP syndrome. And, you know, if your listeners don't know, HELP syndrome is hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, low platelets, and is closely related to preeclampsia, kind of like a cousin, but more severe. And we were like, what? what are you talking about? Like, what is that? Never heard of it before. Doctors never right. say anything. Like, what, what are you right. talking about? But they never explain it. Like, they never explain what it is. What? All they say is, we have to induce you right now. We have to induce you, but we can't do it here. We have to transfer you. Because during this time, my heart rate is really high. So it's going between like 130 and 150, me laying down in a bit. Um, 
So they said they didn't have anybody that could monitor my heart. So I'm like, you know, I just found out my son, it won't be alive when I have him. You want me to be induced. I asked for a C-section. I was like, can I have a C-section? And they were like, no. Again, did not explain why I couldn't have one. They were like, no, we have to induce you, but we have to send you to this other hospital. Told you, we got there at six o'clock, right? We found out he was, um, would be stillborn at 7.50 around that time. I'm waiting on transit. 9.59, they come, they do a CT scan. 10.43, I'm finally leaving the, ho- the ER to go to the other hospital. As I'm in transit, a, do- a resident from the other hospital that I'm, I'm going, I'm on my way to now, calls back to the ER I just left. Ask them if they knew I was bleeding internally. And they, did, they didn't know because they just did the CT scan. Like they had no idea. So I'm laying here from six o'clock to 10.43 PM bleeding internally. And so what happens is they call the ambulance. They're like, no, she has to go to emergency surgery. She has to go to the ER, turn the lights on, get her here now. So I'm, being, I'm rolled into the ER or the OR at this point. And I remember a doctor saying to me, we're getting ready to give you a C-section. Like, you remember I had, because I don't know any of this is going on in the background. Like, I have no idea. And you remember I said I asked for an induction. So I was like, you know, kind of puzzled. But then they like put me to sleep. So ultimately what happened was I was bleeding internally. I had a liter of blood in my stomach. I had a softball size blood clot on my liver. And I was, I was dying. Like I coded, like I literally should not be alive scientifically, right? Like on paper, I shouldn't be alive. Doctors told my husband, we've thrown everything at her that we could. We don't know. Oh my gosh. Like they packed, they packed my body. So they, they, they did this, this C-section. So I was bleeding, like I was bleeding like water. So because a help help syndrome lowers your platelets. So I, my platelets were low, so I wasn't clotting mm-hmm. and, you know, there's just pools of blood in my, there's blood in my stomach. So they, they packed me with like these sponges and they kept me open. Um, they said, I wasn't going to wake up until like Thursday or Friday if I woke up and I ended up actually waking up on Wednesday morning. And I have on mitts and I'm intubated. Oh. And I'm like large, like fluid because of all the fluid and stuff they gave me. I'm like, my thighs are like double the size and and everything. And I'm literally confused, right? Because none of this stuff, like I didn't know anything other than Jace had passed away. So I wake up and my mom, my mom is in the room, lives in Tennessee. So she's like a nine hour drive away. She's in the room and she asks me if I want to hold Jace. And again, I'm intubated, so I can't really talk, but I don't have my glasses or my contacts in. Um, So I'm like looking at them and I'm like, you know, trying to shake my head, yes. But then I'm trying to also tell them that I can't see. Like I won't be able to see him if I hold him. Not really. Um, And unfortunately, my, I had nothing there. So my roommate, my roommate, my best friend had my glasses. So I I ended up getting my husband's glasses to try to hold him. And, you know, I I think I held him for probably less than five minutes before a nurse came and said, we got to take him out because he had to go to the morgue, you know? So ultimately that was the last time I ever saw him. Uh, I was in the hospital for 45 days. I, I was released and then I was sent back the day before his funeral because I ended up getting an infection in my liver where they had embolized it and the part that had embolized got an infection in it or an abscess in it. So the day before his funeral, I was readmitted and me and my husband decided that if one of us couldn't go, then we both wouldn't. And we mm-hmm. had our families kind of handle the service. So that less than five minutes was the only time I ever saw my son and the only time I ever held my son. And rem- rem- remember, I was also intubated, so I really couldn't say anything to him. Not right. that he would know because he was, you know, had passed away, but like, 
you know, when you say goodbye, you want to be able to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, outside of the seven surgeries and the 45 days in the hospital, that, that is really one of the hardest parts of, of all of this, that moment, you know, with my son was stolen from me and Mm -hmm. I'll I'll never be able to get that back. Um, so I'm finally released from the hospital on July 5th. Like if you, if you're thinking about timing right now, I would still literally be in the hospital from May 14th. So doing, doing this with you, like in 2018, Mm -hmm. I would be in the hospital like right now. And so once I got out, it was, you know, your first question is always, you know, what happened? Like, how did we, I did all the things. I did the low dose of aspirin. I went to all the appointments. I had Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, like I had all the things and I did everything they asked me to do, the prenatal vitamins, all the things. You know, when they asked me to go to maternal fetal medicine, I went immediately, like same day, I did all the things. And while I remember while I was in the ER, one of my friends asked me, had they been doing urine samples on me when I was pregnant? And I was like, no. And that stuck out to me for some reason, like when I got out. So I started looking at my medical records and I realized they had not done one since they verified I was pregnant, nothing. So when Jace was measuring small, they didn't do any urine tests. When he fell the non-stress test, they didn't do urine, urine tests, they didn't do blood tests. They did blood, te- blood work, I think the first day of my third trimester, and that was pretty much the only other blood work they did. Um, so with all the other signs and symptoms, basically, because he was exhibiting symptoms, so my blood pressure wasn't high. And you know, again, for your listeners, one of the caveats of HELP syndrome is that you don't have to have high blood pressure. Whereas mm-hmm. preeclampsia, that's pretty much what you have. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and though my, my blood pressure wasn't preeclampsia high, it was actually high for me as a person because mm-hmm. I have a very normal 110 over 60 blood pressure and it got up to like 122 over 90, right? So it wasn't like preeclampsia high, but it was actually just a little bit higher for me. And everything was kind of discarded or they just didn't pay attention to anything or didn't tie the knots, I'll say. They didn't put the puzzle together. So, Mm -hmm. you know, after learning that, I was just mortified. I'm like, what, what? Because every person I talked to after was like, what do you mean? Like they did that to me every single appointment I went to and all, you know, every person I talked to always says that. And, you know, it would have been that something that, you know, because there was protein in my urine. The reason why my friend asked me were they doing urine samples because my urine was almost black because I asked her I was like why did you ask like what was the purpose of you asking me that and I remember like going into one of my appointments one day and one of the nurses saying like do you need to pee I'm like no but do you need for me to pee because I'll figure it out like if you need something from it we could give me some water we'll figure it out Mm -hmm. and she said no don't worry about it so, you know, in my mind, you don't really need that. You just wanted me to, you know, you just wanted to know if I had to be. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, that was one thing. And then the first story I ever heard was Kira Johnson. And when I heard her story, I literally just started crying. Like I cried so hard and I knew, I didn't know like what was happening in maternal health at the time. I didn't know before, I didn't know that before I got pregnant. And I really didn't know it until, you know, after all this happened. And some, I think somebody actually sent me the link to her story. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember listening to that story and watching that video of Charles and, you know, the images of her and just listening to the blood that was in her stomach, the fact that she, you know, they dismissed him so much about like what she was she sat in the the hospital for 10 hours before they gave her a ct scan right and when they took her back they cut her open and she bled out which is which is exactly what would have happened to me if no one had noticed that i was bleeding internally so i i felt like the connection was there and i was like this cannot be real like this cannot be happening to people Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, me and my husband talked about it and I was like, we have to do something because, you know, the whole while we had so much support 
it's so much support. It was unreal. You know, people like my uncle came up here every weekend while I was in the hospital. You're talking about 45 days, like 45 days. He came up here every weekend for a month and a half, you know, just to, just to be here for me. And, you know, all my, well, they also thought I was going to die. Right. So, you know, the doctors weren't really sure what was going to happen. So people were coming just in case, you know, I died. Mm -hmm. and you know we had so much support and people were telling us like you're 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 literally a miracle like you're you're a miracle like my surgeons told me that I was a miracle which is something they don't do but (laughs) they told me they told me I was a miracle and we wanted we didn't want people anybody else to have to go through this right so we were like we need to do something so we started sharing our story and that kind of it's kind of what had like how we founded Jason's journey because it was like there's all these disparities but nobody's talking about the disparities and nobody's talking about stillbirth because you know stillbirth is still taboo especially in our community and we need to bring awareness but we also need to get people to advocate for themselves because Mm -hmm. I didn't know I needed to advocate for him Mm -hmm. because I trusted my doctors to do what they were supposed to do and they failed me and him but you know you know I've learned so much in the last four years just about you know the the disparities in general how people don't know that they can advocate for themselves they people aren't listened to anyway and how a lot of people birth alone yeah you know, people go to their appointments alone. Cause I did, you know, my husband would go to the ultrasounds. I didn't really think he needed to be there to, you know, for them to measure my stomach, like how, you know, they weren't even that long, you know, the appointments weren't even that long, but, you know, in hindsight, somebody needed to be there with me just because, you know, hearing different things like, you know, and you're pregnant, you don't remember crap. <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, remember like, oh, I need to ask the doctor about this. And then you forget by the time you go in there. So you, I mean, that's what pregnancy is. So just to ha- just to engage people in what's going on, talk about the disparities, share our story, share other people's stories. So that's a, another thing that we've done is just share other people's stories and teach people how to advocate for themselves. So we really focus on, you know, just being a champion for you or somebody else. Like, I, COVID brought so much light to disparities in, mater, in maternal and regular health. Like, people are starting to understand, but I still go, just, my cousin had a, a baby, like, two days ago, and she literally said to me, she, she has other children, so she has, like, a 10-year-old, and she was like, yeah, after 10 years, I just didn't think I could get pregnant again. I'm like, yeah, that's not how that works. <laughs> and you and those com is those conversations that we don't have so you know our focus is to have those conversations with people no boo that's not how that works like Mm -hmm. as long as you're ovulating (laughs) and can drop some eggs you can get pregnant yeah point blank period that's it and I've learned that people have no idea. So I've actually partnered with another organization recently. We kind of launched it in April, Black Maternal Health Week. And we, we want to talk to college students. Um, we specifically talked to HBCUs about reproductive health. Like, this is what, like, it's kind of like history. This is what's going on in the country. This is what you can do to help. Like this is this is what we're working on. Mm-hmm. So we, we we speak about like midwifery, like how you know how that was. Like births were done at home prior mm-hmm. to the eighteen hundreds. Then physicians started to come in, and then they booted all the midwives out. Um, breastfeeding, things like that, like just a little, a little bit of history, just so you know where we're coming from. And then we tell you what's going on. Like, look, the United States is the worst industrialized nation to have a kid in, Mm -hmm. despite how much we pay for birth. But what we're doing about it is 
their support for you, right? There's there's midwives, there's doulas, there's all these things, and there's legislation that we're trying to get passed in order to make the system not as racist as it is, because you know that's the that's the problem. It's a racist system, but it was created that way. And a lot of people say, "Oh, the system's broken." No, it's designed exactly the way it works, exactly the way it, is, it was designed to work. Mm-hmm. But it's not in our favor. So when you talk about African American women, are three to four times like more likely to you know die in childbirth. That's because of racism. Yeah. And you know, I told you, I. I went to all my appointments, right? I have Blue Cross Blue Shield. I have a master's degree. And do you know that like having a master's degree increases your risk for death in, in, for a black woman? Isn't that insane? Is that not, doesn't that just blow, that it, it blows my mind. And I have like, it makes no sense. Like make it make sense. It, it makes absolutely no sense. And it, it oh. Yeah, I know. I know I'm there with you. So, you know, teaching people like, look, you, you have a right to change your doctor. Yes. If they're not listening to you, if you don't feel comfortable changing your doctor and you're asking for something, make sure they put that in your record. I asked for this and you denied it to me, Mm -hmm. you know, just things like that. Just having people be, be aware of your body. Like, no, like having an abnormal period is not normal. It's mm-hmm. in the term. It's not normal. And birth control doesn't help you figure out why your period's not normal. And I think we've got, gotten so c- accustomed to having an abnormal period and then getting on birth control. And that's that's not a, that, that doesn't help you with why your period's abnormal. Absolutely not. It masks the symptom it masks and it, it offers you no treatment. No, no treatment. So, you know, just having those conversations, because, you know, Black women are also more likely to get fibro tumors. Mm-hmm. I have tons of friends who have fibro tumor surgery. And, you know, there are other options. Like, that surgery is not the first way, first way to go. And a lot of doctors won't tell you that. But just knowing and, like, researching. And birth work isn't just doulas and midwives. It's also acupuncturists and herbalists and uh, birth, childbirth educators and, ac- and chiropractors and all these things and just getting that information out because people need to know their options because I honestly felt like if I didn't if I'd have known what I know now and I got pregnant I would have had a doula mm-hmm. I was high risk so I couldn't have had a you know just had a midwife so you know having a, a doula and an OB is fine or having a midwife and a doula is fine you know depending on your risk factors mm-hmm. but information is power if you're able to use it and know and that's what we want to do that's what we want we want to teach people that you need to be informed about what's going on so you can make better options Mm -hmm. and you have the options that you can make so that's what that's that's my goal that's a lot I really so (laughs) it's great you have more questions Kristen (laughs) you answered a lot of my questions (laughs) more questions because I feel like I no <laughs> you know I appreciate it I I love your passion and your story is so heartbreaking and so unfortunately the story of so many people and, and that's what drives me right like it's it's so many people's stories and and you know tell me I was like I'm tired of hearing my story and they're like Tamika shut up just hush whatever but I want to hear I want to hear other people because it's not just me and I you know I hear people's stories but there's so many people out there that just don't want to share their stories I don't know I think you know we we have to embrace like I understand why you don't want to share your story Mm -hmm. but I also know that your story is bound to help somebody else Mm-hmm. because our stories are are so different no matter no matter what it is like my story is completely different than my friend Jade's story and we both had help syndrome so I just you know I I want people who have stories to share them because even in your family like you know since this happened to me a lot of people have come to me it's like oh I had a stillbirth and so and so and so and so and you're like 
because you knew, but you didn't know, like you remember them being pregnant and then you, and nobody ever talked about it again. And then I have a friend of mine who has experienced maternal death, like a lot in her life and wasn't, you know, just, just has known so many people, but I had never known anybody who had like really bad, you know, preeclampsia, but you know, everything turned out fine. And it's so crazy. Cause that's what people tell you. Like when you have preeclampsia or something like that, they're like, oh, well, you know, it's not really trauma because you're fine and your baby's fine. But no, right. If you feel like your birth was traumatic, then you had a traumatic birth. Nobody can decide your trauma for you. And a lot of people get told just because yes. they're fine now and their baby's fine now that their birth story, you know, isn't their birth story, but it, but it most definitely is. Mm-hmm. So those stories we also need to hear and we also need to share because they're, my sister-in-law had preeclampsia and yes, my niece and my nephew are fine, but she still has a birth story because mm-hmm. she almost didn't make it, I think at some point, but it's also a birth story and it's, you know, it's a traumatic birth story and, but it's still a story mm-hmm. and it's her story. So. Yeah, definitely. And you can have beautiful outcomes and you can have, a, you know, a birth where um, maybe even nothing really necessarily went wrong in the birth, but you weren't respected. Mm-hmm. You were belittled or you weren't listened to. Um, that's wrong. And that is traumatic. And whoever is telling you that it's not, um, you know, they might just be coming from a place where they don't want you to think that it's traumatic. And they think that if you don't think it's traumatic, then you'll just be better. But a lot of times it's, you know, the doctors that are telling you that it it wasn't traumatic. Um, And they're, they're not doing it for you. And that, I, I hate that. I hate that so much. I went to a birth one time where the doctor came in after the baby had died and literally told my clients that God was trusting them to go through this hard time. And I, oh my gosh. My face, right. (laughs) The anger. Oh my gosh. And I just, I just don't, like, I don't understand, you know, healthcare in general right now is really bad. You know, it doesn't, not just for maternal health, but just in general, just because there's so much disrespect in healthcare and it's so monopolized and it's so uncaring, right? It's so uncaring. And people, why, people are already distrusting, especially people of color, of medical professionals. And you're in your most, like a lot of people don't go to the hospital or to the doctor unless they're really sick. Mm -hmm. And when you're sick, you're literally the most vulnerable you can be. Mm -hmm. And then to go and be disrespected and not listen to, angers me deeply Mm -hmm. because then there there's those people who are sick and they're by themselves and they don't have anybody to advocate for them and they don't know how to advocate for themselves or know that they can and they don't get better because somebody has told them that oh well this is just this or you'll be fine in the morning and some people die right I could have died yeah. Women die every day because somebody is not listening to them. Mm-hmm. We have to fix that. Like we have to fix that because if you're not going to fix it, let's not call it healthcare anymore. Let's just call it, I don't know, but healthcare is not a good term. Right. Because there's, there's just, it's not based on people's care. It's just based on how many people you can get in a room and out of a room in a day is what I feel like it is. And it's, and it's not every doctor, of course, but you know, or or every nurse or right. No, and it's passionate and helpful, but the numbers speak for themselves. It's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like it's a lot of doctors and a lot of nurses and a lot of physicians that are causing the numbers to be as high as they are. So Mm -hmm. 
we just, we have to fix that. We have to have centered, patient-centered care. We have to be culturally competent of what people are going through. And I think, you know, in general, as human beings, we have to understand that everybody is going through something. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're their physician. Right? It Mm -hmm. seems so simple, but yet it's so hard for people to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially, I think, just the sheer number of patients Mm -hmm. that a a nursing staff, because it's the the nursing staff runs the LMD board. I mean, the doctors are generally, especially if it's at night, they're asleep. They wake them up when it's time to push um, or they've got a serious question. Um, And then they've got so many patients. So many patients. That they're not even... I mean, they, they can't even keep everybody's name straight. So they're just calling you mama. You know, and that's probably, you know, the new, the armband thing. Cause they didn't do that all the time. Like, uh, this is, this is your medicine. <laughs> like what's mm-hmm. your name and you verify your name and let me look at your wrist and let me see your armband. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because there's so many people that they're responsible for. And mm-hmm. then it's, yeah, it, it's a monopoly. Like it's just. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So even the people that want to care you know, they might be bringing in the trauma of the patient that they're carrying for next door Mm -hmm. into your space because they have so many of them um, and honestly don't have time to reset in between rooms, in between days. You know, medical professionals are, are incredibly traumatized as well. And you can see it sometimes in their care. Um, and we, we need to do something about that. I mean, we really do. Um, we really do. There, there has to be a, an overall restructuring of all of that. Like, it, we, can't, we can't continue like this. Mm-mm. We can't. And yeah, we have to, we have to do something about it. Because it's really, it's really sad. It's really sad. Because like I said, you're, when you're in the hospital, you're the, the most vulnerable that you'll ever be. Because right. you don't have control over anything. Like, you're there because you don't have, you don't know what to do, literally. Um, and we have to, we have to fix that. So what sort of options do you wish that you had known about before you had Jace? I, I wish I'd known I needed a doula because I honestly think everybody does. Um, I wish I had, I had, for me personally, I wish I had done way more research than I had done on my my doctor and trying to find one because a doctor I had, I'd just been going to for my regular pap smears, you know, but I wish I'd have known that, you know, like I said, of the crisis of everything that's going on. Um, as far as options, I did what they told me to do, right? So I wish I didn't, they don't mention help syndrome. They've never, I never said, they, no one's ever said anything about help syndrome to me until I, they told me I had it. Right. So they, you know, they talk a lot about preeclampsia. That's one of the things they, they shoot out there all the time, but just tell, tell me, you know, and I remember, I remember my doctor asking me, so what do you need to, what do you want to know? (laughs) What do you think I need to know? Right. I don't know. Is it your job? Like what, what, (laughs) like, I wouldn't ask you to come on my job to tell me what to do. (laughs) You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you problem, right? Problem. And I had no idea what help syndrome was. So when I got it, I was just like, I didn't know what the symptoms of the other symptoms of preeclampsia were, right? Like he never mentioned protein in your urine. So if he had said that, I'm like, oh, well, I haven't had a urine test in so, so long. So why, you know, if that's a symptom, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, The, the upper right quadrant pain is what was happening to me that morning. Oh. I didn't know that. Um, I was also not supposed to throw up like that in my third trimester. Mm-mm. Didn't know that. So just those things, like just basic things, like that, those are actually symptoms of preeclampsia that you told me I was high risk for. Mm-hmm. Right. I would have need to know that. Yeah, just a basic, these are different things that if you're doing this, please call us, let us know. Like if you throw up in your third trimester, please let us know. I thought I had food poisoning. Right. 
I didn't know I wasn't supposed to throw up. I literally was like, oh God, this is a funny joke because I hadn't, you know, I, I didn't have morning sickness. So I was like, ah, now, <laughs> now. Now I'm sick, right? Right. So those are, I mean, I wish, I wish I'd known I needed a doula. I definitely would have. I think if I had one, that would have saved my life because we'd had, we'd had a conversation and she's like, oh, well, you know, what's your urine looking like? Or, or when mm-hmm. he measure small, did they say why he's measuring small? You know, cause they didn't seem hyper, uh, you know, like they weren't like very cautious. Like they didn't seem anxious about, you know, him measuring small. But I also know that generally black babies measure small. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, like now I'm looking back on it. Was it, they, what were they so nonchalant about it? Because they just assumed that my baby would measure small because he was black. You know what I mean? Like you think about those things. Um, so that's, I mean, that's really it. I wish I didn't know more about what they told me I was high risk for. So I could have prepared myself. Like when I wasn't getting the urine samples, I would have been like, Hey, I'm not getting the urine samples. And I have a compliance background. So I work a lot in controls and mitigating risk and stuff. And so that stands out for me. Mm -hmm. Like I work at a bank and we're ridiculously regulated. And how did I go eight months without getting a urine sample? And that's something that you give to every, you say you give to every patient at every appointment. That's baffling to me. That's baffling. Me too. And nobody noticed. And no, nobody noticed. So you know, just things, just things like that. Like just being, like I said, advocating for myself. I should have asked more questions. You know, I wish I'd known to ask more questions whenever they were saying he was measuring small. They, like I said, they weren't anxious about it. They didn't seem worried about it. So I wasn't worried about it. I'm a very chill person in general. So it was like, I don't really get like hyper like ah, about a lot of stuff. So they didn't seem bothered. And then the next week they told me he was fine. So I'm like, okay, he's fine. Like, that is awesome. And then, you know, four days he was gone and I was dying. Just like that. So that's, you know, just that part. Yeah, all the, uh, that's it really, as far as Mm -hmm. options, I think. So sorry to hear all of that. It is just, (sighs) okay. So tell me a little bit more about Jace's journey and your specific mission. What, what does Jace's journey do? We, we do a lot of stuff. And when I say we, I mean me. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, We, we talked about this earlier. My husband is a very good track coach. So he, he is super busy, but I, my goal, when I first started Jace's journey, I wasn't even sure what I wanted to do at all. Um, and then more and more, the more I learned and the more I got into it, it's really, we're really focused on educating, um, advocacy. I do a lot of like lobbying. I was, you know, at the, our state legislators last week with um, the March of Dawn. So I work with a lot of organizations when it comes to lobbying because they've already written the script. I just need to be there, right? Yeah, <laughs> so I work with the March of Dawn. I work with Mom Congress. Um, Um, So I do a lot of advocacy work. Education is my thing, right? I told you, like, I've had conversations with people who don't know about their bodies or what they want to do. You know, I got pregnant at 40 and women are getting pregnant later. It's the thing that's happening right now, especially in, in the Black community. So I just want people to know that you can. You can actually get pregnant at 40. You just need to know what to do to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And it needs to, it needs to start with the thought, like the thought of when do I want to have a kid? What, what does having, what does getting pregnant at 40 mean? It is harder to get pregnant at 40. It could actually be hard to get pregnant at 25, depending on who you are, Mm -hmm. but it can happen. And you just need the right resources and the right tools in order to make it happen. So I want, I we educate people on on things like that, um, advocating for themselves, knowing you know, knowing your body, knowing when things aren't right. Um, mm-hmm. We talk about disparities because a lot of people still don't know that there are all these disparities in maternal and infant health, and I think you know having that information is is vital to a safe pregnancy because you're hyper aware. 
Like Mm -hmm. if you feel something in your body, you know, like, oh, I feel this, but my doctor's not listening to me. Let me get another resource. Let me do something else. So Mm -hmm. you protect yourself from what's going on. So we educate a lot on that. Um, We started with a 5K um, in 2019. And I had never done a 5K before in my life and had never, (laughs) ever wanted to do one. But it it kind of felt fell in my lap. So we, that's, that's our fundraiser for the, every year we do that this year because of some stuff going on in the city, I might have to change it a little bit. Like I'm still waiting on confirmation to actually be able to have it where I need to have it. So we might have to move it, but, and that's usually in in October and it falls in line with um, pregnancy and infant loss awareness month. Mm -hmm. I speak a lot to with different organizations I serve a lot on a lot of panels just talking about our story and you know the things we talked about here advocating Mm -hmm. for yourself and you know what this experience has done for me and how I you know I want to use this experience in my life which is like the absolute worst thing that's ever happened to me to 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 make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else and so I use my voice a lot (laughs) right I use my voice a lot, but it's also my therapy. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people ask me, you know, did you go to therapy? Yes, I did. Me and my husband went to group therapy first, and then we did couples therapy until our lovely, amazing therapist left the organization that we were going to. And I use this as my therapy. Like, this helps me heal. It also helps me keep his name a lot because Jason's an amazing person. I honestly feel like he saved my life. Um, and I just want, I just want people to have safe pregnancies and be able to take their kids home and not have the box that I got, you know, mm-hmm. with the pictures that they took of him and be able to love on their kids and not have traumatic births and just to be able to make it out of pregnancy alive. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. what, that's what, that's my, that's my mission. It's really to bring awareness to the disparities in maternal and infant health. And we do it through ed- education, advocacy and community engagement. So that's our goal and that's our mission. And we, we are on Instagram, Facebook. Um, do I have, I'm personally on Twitter. I do not tweet. I am not a tweety person. Oh, we're um, not on Twitter. That's yeah. <laughs> it's, I don't, not our thing. I get it, but I don't get it. Um, but I definitely, we're definitely on uh, Instagram as Jason's Journey Inc. We are on Facebook as Jason's Journey. And I am personally on LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn. We're also on LinkedIn. Um, as Jason's journey, and mm-hmm. I'm on Instagram and Facebook. I think I have a Twitter account too. As Tamika Isaac, actually, I think it's Miss James now Isaac on Instagram. You know, <laughs> um, you know, um, <laughs> we can post links to all of that in the yeah. description. Yeah, and we're at www like jasonjourney.org. So, and, you know, you can fill out the form and get more information or request more information, but we have, you know, a, a synopsis or a summary of a story, of our story on our website. So if you want more, if you want to ask me a question or something, feel free. I'm an open book. I try to be as transparent and honest as I possibly can be. Like right now, I have another um, meeting I have to go to. <laughs> that I'm late for. A plan oh, no. For, for mom congress they'll be okay yeah it's okay. fine okay well thank you so much for joining well, me today fine. that well, you went through and answered all my questions without me even asking them which is fantastic it's my favorite kind of interview where i get to Sorry. listen <laughs> no not at all oh. i thank you i'm I, I'm so honored to hear your story and I just really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. Um, you're a joy and I enjoy you very much. So oh, thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you for having me. It's been, we, we talked before this. Yes, we definitely have to like say 
connected. Oh, um, for sure. My brain has been <laughs> running since I first met you. I'm like, what are all of the ways that we are going to support each other? Because I just keep coming up with more. No, so. Yeah, absolutely. Just reach out. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. <laughs> Oh, you're, you're stuck with me now, boo. <laughs> yes, oh, that is my favorite. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining me. I will not keep you so you can go join your next meeting. Um, yeah. The following media content is intended to only be an educational reference guide and should not be taken as a substitute for medical advice. While KC Women's Ministry adheres to strict self-set guidelines, any advice, instructions, or information found within this media is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. KCWM makes every effort to broadcast correct information. We simply present the views based on evidence-based information. We welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. We are not sponsored by drug or device companies. By listening or viewing this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice to treat any medical condition and either yourself or others, including but not limited to patients that you are treating. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast. Under no circumstances shall Casey Women's Ministry, any guests or contributors to the podcast or any employees, associates, or affiliates of Casey Women's Ministry be responsible for damages arising from the use of the podcast. Viewer discretion is advised.